Good evening. I'm Dr. Leela Lewis, and this is another presentation of Liberty and Health Alliance. We are so glad that you have joined us this evening. Tonight comes with the title of Liberty of Conscience Document. This is the official release and global appeal. You know, many, many individuals around the world globally have lost their jobs based on recent mandates. Now education, even of the youngest populations, are at risk. Health care, even some have lost their own personal physicians because of a desire, for one reason or another, to not accept the COVID vaccine. The result has been quite phenomenal. And tonight we are going to discuss the issue and actually make an appeal based on a document entitled to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, an appeal of defense of liberty of conscience. What tonight is not, just at the outset to say, tonight is not a political discussion. It's not against any political party or authority. It's based on the Bible and in support of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The views expressed by those who are participating are their own personal views and do not necessarily represent the organization or entity that they may be associated with. This is a global call to the church at large, to the Christian church, and in particular, the Seventh-day Adventist church, to stand, to stand with courage and defend liberty of conscience for all, regardless if one chooses to be vaxxed or unvaxxed. Liberty and Health Alliance believes it is time for the church, the broader church, to publicly defend liberty of choice for all of its members, those within our own Seventh-day Adventist congregation and those within our broader Christian faith. Every individual has the right to choose for themselves what they wish to do with their own body. Now is the time to let our collective voices be known. That said, if you have not done so already, we ask that you go to the website libertyandhealth.org where you can access the document that we will be talking about tonight. At the conclusion of tonight's presentation, we hope you too will sign the document that now as of currently 7,000 512 individuals have signed, including 1,400 medical professionals and over 450 pastors. Together, we're following in the footsteps of those who have gone before us. Lately, I personally have been reading Esther and have been so impressed with how she, like Joseph, like so many others, like Daniel, stood when everyone else did not. And I've been particularly struck with the following verse. For if you remain completely silent, her cousin Mordecai appealed to her in the certain situation that she was in. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. Who knows if you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And so we hope and pray, although this is a direct appeal to Seventh-day Adventists, we also appeal to our other Christian brothers and sisters that if you have not yet stood, that you will let your voice be known, as Esther's was and so many others, to help defend all, all in faith of liberty of conscience. With that, I want to introduce my new good friend, Dr. Michael Hossel who's going to be opening us with prayer. Dr. Hossel, can you have opening prayer for us tonight, please? Yes, let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer today because during this time in our life's history, we have nowhere else to turn but to you. We come to you in prayer because you have called us to come together in prayer. And tonight... We are gathered here because there are millions of people around the world, millions of people who are faced with unprecedented pressure to conform to mandates that threaten their conscientious right to choose. 
Your people are faced with costly consequences, loss of livelihood, loss of education, loss of the ability to travel, to visit family, or to conduct business or evangelism in some place around the world. This year, many have felt the loneliness of isolation, and many, many have suffered with the loss of loved ones. We have experienced pain. And so tonight we want to turn to you. We want to turn to you this evening for wisdom. We want to turn to you this evening for courage. Courage to stand for our convictions, whatever they may be. We thank you that you are a God who establishes and established the government of the universe on the freedom of choice and liberty, freedom to choose. And so this evening we want to choose you. We want to choose your word over all the noise that surrounds us. We want to choose truth over the powers that would silence us. And we want to choose principle because Jesus Christ showed us that there are principles to live by upon this earth that are more precious than life itself. And so we choose truth over tyranny, liberty over conformity, humility over hubris. May your spirit guide our discussion this evening. Bless us, each one who is listening here and those who are participating, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Hossel. And I want to invite the rest of our guests. Again, if you just now joined us, tonight's presentation by Liberty and Health Alliance, we will be going over the document that is on the website, libertyandhealth.org. Again, to the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Appeal in Defense of Liberty of Conscience. Before we get started, I want to introduce tonight's guests. And as I call their name, we will be bringing them up on the screen. The first person you've already heard from is Dr. Michael Hossel. Dr. Hossel is a professor of religion and director of the Institute of Archaeology at Southern Adventist University. He has held both Fulbright and Samuel Crest Foundation fellowships authored numerous books and done numerous evacuations, uh, ex excavations, I apologize, throughout the Middle East. Dr. Hossel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to introduce Mr. Joy, Jay Cameron. Mr. Cameron is a constitutional lawyer in Canada. He's litigated all levels and various levels within his government. He'll be joining us a little bit later. I just wanted to give you his introduction at this time. He personally believes that all people are endowed with unalienable rights, that civil recognition of those rights of the individual conscience is foundation to all national success. So we'll be hearing from Mr. Jay Cameron from Canada in a little bit. I want to introduce Pastor David Stokich. Dr. Stokich is a senior pastor at Newcastle, Australia. He's a former missionary, department leader, and the former conference president and vice president. And we'll be hearing from him in just a little bit as well. Pastor James Rafferty, who was also on the committee that wrote and helped comprise this document. Pastor Rafferty has been a good friend of mine for many years. So good to have you again, Pastor Rafferty. He's an ordained minister and evangelist. He's authored numerous books and been in full-time ministry for over 37 years a particular emphasis on Daniel and Revelation. And he has been married for 32 years to his wonderful wife. They live in North Fork, California and are blessed with two adult children. Thank you, Pastor Rafferty, for joining us. Good to be here. Good to have you as well. And Dr. Greg King, a very good longtime friend of mine. He was my professor at my former university. It is a pleasure to have you back with us again, Dr. King. Dr. King is a longtime religion professor. He's taught, like I said, at several Seventh-day Adventist institutions and colleges, both here in the United States and abroad. He has his PhD in biblical studies from Union Theological Seminary, a wonderful godly man, a wonderful friend, and it's just a pleasure to have you with us here again, Dr. King. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. It's nice to be with you. Thank you. And of course, Mr. Jonathan Zirkel, he serves as our Vice President for Legal Affairs. Mr. Zirkel is a trial attorney in California. He has 
performed various trials throughout uh, the state of California. He's a federal employment attorney and religious liberty attorney. Again, Mr. Zirkel, we look forward to having you here with us again tonight. Thank you for joining us. We also have Pastor Ron Kelly. Pastor Ron Kelly is the senior pastor of the Village Seventh-day Adventist Church in Berrien Springs, Michigan. His wife, Colleen, is a school teacher there, and together they have four children. Pastor Kelly, it's a pleasure to have you with us as well. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. We also have Mr. Ron Knott. Mr. Knott, I have come to greatly admire. He is very well versed. He's worked at various entities within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, including the North American Division, the Adventist Disaster and Relief Agency, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He currently lives in Berrien Springs with his wife, Esther, and has worked at Andrews University in the Public Relations and Publishing Department for 31 years. Again, Mr. Knott, I cannot thank you so much for your involvement in the organization and the document. Thank you so much. We also have Mr. Greg Nelson. Mr. Nelson is an amazing person. I'm so glad that I've had the opportunity of getting to know him. He's the Director of Investments for Loma Linda University Foundation. He has held that position for over 20 years. He's worked in numerous different investment firms throughout the course of his career. He's a member of the Investment Committee for Loma Linda University, La Sierra University and investment management for over 20 years, 28 years. He's married to his wonderful wife, Wendy Nelson, who is a physician, and together they have four children. So again, Mr. Nelson, it is a pleasure to have you with us here tonight, and thank you for your contribution to the document that we'll be examining this evening. And finally, we have Dr. Wes Youngberg. Dr. Youngberg, I have come to greatly admire. Dr. Youngberg is a practicing lifestyle medicine a specialist. He's a clinical nutritionist in Southern California, trained in Loma Linda University. He has his master's in nutrition, a doctor of public health, and he focuses on preventive medicine. Dr. Youngberg is always busy seeing patients. This I've come to find out, and that's a very good thing. He's written multiple books, he uh, specifically on how to prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease and cognitive disorders, specifically with lifestyle methods. He's achieved uh, also how to achieve maximum health benefits using lifestyle changes. He's the founding director and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Dr. Youngberg, it is a pleasure, honor to have you with us here. And also thank you for your contributions to the document. Uh, it is a privilege to be involved in this program with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Youngberg. Well, with that, it is we have a wonderful array of guests. We hope that you'll stick with us. We have a very special guest. All of you are going to want to wait and listen for, and that's Dr. Ben Carson. We will be introducing him when we are ready later on in the program. So definitely stay tuned. I want to start with Mr. Knott tonight. Mr. Knott, again, thank you for joining us. We'll bring Mr. Knott up. Can you please describe how the Liberty of Conscience document even came into being? What is its purpose and who is it addressed to specifically? Well, Dr. Lewis, it is an honor to work with you. And perhaps I should uh, correct that and say it's an honor to work for you. And by saying that, that gives a pretty big piece of the picture of how this document came about. Anyone that knows Dr. Lewis knows that she is a godly woman, a woman of prayer, a woman of deep faith. And when the Lord laid on her uh, a conviction, she followed that up with a great deal of prayer and uh, a great deal of thought and brought together a team of people as only her kind of leadership can do. And that team worked together uh, exceptionally well to bring about this document. Regarding um, what the document is intended to do, um, I think in its simplest form, the document is intended to wake us up. Uh, we've all dealt with uh, the issues of the pandemic for the last uh, year and a half, but in the process of doing that, we've found our ways of accommodating uh, how we live and how we adjust 
And for many of us, the issues may not affect us uh, directly or the Lord by his grace has protected us. But at the same time, millions of people around the world, of course, have been devastated by the disease itself, but millions more are on the verge of being devastated by how we respond to this crisis. And this document is intended to call each of us individually, wake us up, to help us understand what the issues are and what we're confronting. It's addressed very simply to all of us. It says right in the title to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And of course that can also include our brothers and sisters in other faith communions. But initially we're talking to ourselves. And yes, that includes us who, who as we say, sit in the pew and it includes also those who are designated to lead us in some particular way from the pulpit or from other forms of church organizational structure. So it's addressed to all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ. And the basic message is we need to wake up and do what the Lord is calling us to do at this time. Mr. Knott, thank you so much. I do want to say that was a very gracious um, statement that you made about myself. But like I said already, this team has been such an inspiration to me and you in particular um, have been a, a great, a great blessing. So I just want to, again, thank you for all of your work as well. And thank you for that, that very heartfelt answer. As we embark in the discussion for tonight, let us look at this. As the document at the very outset says, it's calling us to courage, to stand, to stand for something that is so pivotal to Christianity, to individuals, the liberty to choose for oneself what one wants for their own body. This is where we're going with tonight's discussion. Pastor Ron Kelly, we have a question for you. The document states it's a call for courage, like I just mentioned, a courage to stand. But sometimes it's easier to just put one's head down, to just kind of go along with the flow. Why do you believe at this particular time it is so pivotal for the Seventh-day Adventist community in particular to stand with courage? Pastor Kelly. Uh, thank you. It's an excellent question. Uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, families take care of their own. And Seventh-day Adventists, by and large, have produced more medical professionals than probably any other uh, religion in the world, denomination. And many of those individuals sacrificed when there was no uh, safety net in the form of a vaccine. Uh, and they're looking now for the privilege to continue exercising free will and agency in regards to taking the vaccine. Uh, secondly, I would say there's a lot of people that don't have anywhere to go. They, they need a network of support because much of the thinking of the world based on fear is aligned against them. And it appears that the deep appreciation for them as heroes before has turned into the animus of, uh, of, of un, unresolved truth seeking uh, where dialogue can't really prevail for the safety net of those that are that have already risked. And so people need somewhere to go. They need a support structure. And there are a lot of people in the world right now uh, that aren't aware that their body is the temple of God. And I believe standing up right now is a part of a witness, a uh, health message that prepares the body temple uh, to be simply and easily impressed by the Holy Spirit. And then I would say also people don't know what's coming. And free societies protect honest dialogue and the process of truth seeking. Uh, we know what Revelation teaches about the lamb speaking as a dragon. And the last reason I would say we need to stand up right now is that the world needs to see the nobility of true Christianity in action. And there is a way to talk about ideas without demonizing and demagoguing people. And we as Seventh-day Adventists can show that way. We can maintain that beautiful nobility and respectfulness of demeanor, that excellent spirit. And uh, of all people with the principles of Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit, it's a great opportunity for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to model what truth seeking is about and how to protect the vulnerable. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. That was very inspirational. I do have a follow-up question for you on that before you uh, depart. Has this courage to stand been biblically represented? Can we find biblical examples in, in scripture of individuals who stood when perhaps we already mentioned one of them being Esther, 
when perhaps no one else stood? Pastor Kelly. Well, they're all over the place. I mean, it's Joseph staying true to his convictions in a foreign land and uh, finding himself in prison. It's uh, Ahab and Elijah. It's Elijah being accused of being the troubler of Israel. And in true humility and God-ordained confidence, he can say, I'm not the troubler of Israel, uh, you are. It's Daniel in a lion's den, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The, the illustrations are all over the place. And I think we greatly underestimate the emotional uh, demands and the living faith that those people exercised. Thank you, Pastor Thank you. Kelly. Again, as we're making the call for courage, we have the wonderful, beautiful examples given to us in scripture of so many others that have gone before us that have stood alone with courage to stand and they have been blessed by God. Well, with that, we wanna to go to Dr. King. Dr. King, in section two of the document, it discusses the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist church believes that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The temple, I kind of describe when I talk about the temple as a dwelling place. How does our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit, this belief that we have believed for 160 years, how does that relate particularly to the COVID vaccine situation? Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for the question. It's a privilege to be here with you on this video cast. I like to go to the Word of God itself, where that teaching of the body as the temple of the Holy Spirit actually emerges quite clearly. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. And I really like how, how Paul begins that passage, do you not know? And when the apostle says that, there's the clear implication that we should be aware of what he's about to say. It's a rhetorical question. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I think the core of that passage, Dr. Lewis, is what is stated right at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, you are not your own. In other words, we don't just belong to ourselves, but we belong to God. And, and then the challenge that comes in verse 20, therefore glorify God in your body. And so what the document calls us to do is that in all of our choices that we make with our health and with our body, we are called to glorify God. Now, I want to clarify what it states clearly in the document is this document does not argue for or against receiving a vaccination, but rather maintains that the decision is a personal spiritual choice. And I would like to add that choice should be made with three adverbs in mind. We learned in English class that the words that ended in L-Y were usually adverbs. We should proceed carefully. That is, we shouldn't jump quickly to a decision in this matter. We should proceed intelligently. And as the quote at the end of the document tells us, and we will review that quote later on, that will indicate that some personal research should be involved in this, listening to various positions, taking time to read and think reflectively, to proceed intelligently, and then most of all, to proceed prayerfully. I really like the promise in James chapter 1, verse 5, Dr. Lewis, where we are promised that if we ask God for wisdom, that he will grant it to us abundantly as long as we ask in faith. And so, as you know, we've wanted to proceed under the guidance of God as we constructed this document in a way that would point forward to the church in a positive way and to encourage people to treasure their body as the temple of God and to make a choice accordingly in connection with vaccinations. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much, Dr. King. King. That's very important that we remember that. And along the lines of the body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, there are other principles throughout the Bible that we as Seventh-day Adventist Christians have held in our hearts and in our minds that are supporting this idea that we must value our bodies for God's glory. I'm going to call Pastor James Rafferty. Pastor Rafferty, what are some biblical examples that Seventh-day Adventist have used in the past and continue to do so as evidence of protecting our bodies as God's holy temple or the place that he wants to dwell? Well, the biblical, Dr. Lewis, uh, Leo Lewis, the biblical examples for this are from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Um, we think about the fact that we're created in the image of God. That's how we start as human beings. And then in Leviticus, God lays out some very clear 
um, details of how our bodies are to be maintained, the diet that we should follow, what we should put into our bodies, and what we should not put into our bodies. Daniel, we found, was very uh, conscientious about this, even in Babylon when he was taken captive with his friends. Uh, Babylon was given a portion of the king's food and drink, but he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with those things that God had actually forbidden. And he requested politely that he would be able to eat of pulse, that is, those things that are sown and water to drink, basically a vegetarian diet. And he negotiated that with Melzar, respectfully, lovingly, was given a time of test. And after that time of test, it was proven that Daniel's diet was actually the healthiest for him and for Nebuchadnezzar, for the kingdom, for the benefits of the kingdom. So we see these examples in the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, we see a continuation of this. As, as Greg said, 1 Corinthians 6 talks about our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says that whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we should do all to the glory of God. And of course, Revelation 14, the everlasting gospel, calls us to fear God and to give glory to Him. So whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, God is first. Our first allegiance is to God. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't have any allegiance to earthly powers. God has ordained the earthly powers. Civil governments also deserve our allegiance and our support. But we are to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, the things that have his image and superscription, is what Jesus says. And we are to render unto God the things that are his, the things that have his image and superscription. And as Christians, as Adventists, we believe that God is our creator. We're made in his image and our bodies have his image and superscription and they are rendered first and foremost to him. Mr. Rafferty, that was, that was very, very well stated. And I, I just think to myself, what a beautiful message. What a beautiful message of truth that God has given, not, not just to Seventh-day Adventists. This is to all humanity throughout time. He wants us to be a living example of him. What a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. Well, with that, with that understanding, it's been over 160 years since the Seventh-day Adventist Church began teaching these principles of health. Dr. Wes Youngberg, specializing in lifestyle medicine, I'm excited to invite him. The whole section five of the document talks about this aspect of lifestyle medicine and these principles, sometimes called the eight doctors within our community, etc. Tell us a little bit more about that and why it's so important, Dr. Youngberg. The eight natural remedies are amazing and should be taken advantage by everybody. And if they were properly, it would dramatically decrease the risk of even getting infected or if infected, actually developing a severe enough infection to end up in the hospital or potentially dying. So the, the main goal uh, that I've been working with all my patients, and by the way, not one of my patients over the last year and a half has died of COVID. Uh, and I didn't expect that. But it's just amazing that people who actually follow the principles carefully and we apply all the principles, not just one or two, the ones that we like, but if we apply all the principles, it dramatically lowers the risk. Let me give you a couple quick examples. Uh, in, in July of 2021, the British Medical Journal published an interesting study of health professionals that had been exposed to COVID-19 and their work and they determined if there was a relationship between what they ate, our diet, and, and their risk of getting infected or developing a moderate to severe symptoms where that would, in, you know, that would be serious to their health and potentially leading to death. Well, what they found was, was just phenomenal. It was amazing. They found that those individuals who had chosen to consume a whole foods or plant-based diet essentially, uh, uh, an aspect that the Seventh Adventist Church health message has promoted for, for over 100 years now. And those individuals who did this actually had a 73% lower risk of getting a moderate to severe infection. If, if they got infected, it was 73% lower risk of it, of it getting bad. Uh, uh, contrary to that, or the alternative to that, those individuals who chose to eat a low carbohydrate, high protein diet, basically a higher meat-based diet, 
were four, almost four times more likely to develop moderate to severe symptoms if infected. And so diet has a huge impact. The last thing real quick, it was an interesting um, experience that occurred at a, at a seminary in, in 1918. This was a Seventh Day Adventist seminary where 90 out of the 120 individuals going to the seminary, including students and faculty, came down with the Spanish flu. An infection was far worse than COVID-19 is uh, today. And, um, and not one of them got seriously ill or died. And the reason was is that they immediately followed the principles of the eight doctors, the eight natural remedies. And the first principle is immediate bed rest. As soon as they got sick, they got rest. They made sure they had good ventilation, good exposure to sunlight. And they also made sure that they got the contrast hot and cold fomentations or, or basically using what we call hydrotherapy to, to heat the body, get the temperature up, and then use ice or cold water to cool it off back and forth multiple times throughout the day. My patients over the last year and a half have said that nothing has worked as good to alleviate symptoms and help them get through COVID-19 than what we call the hot cold water therapies or hydrothermal therapy. And so there are many things that we can do that dramatically lower the risk of having problems uh, that, that basically work so well, it, it, uh, it dramatically would decrease the need for any kind of mandate uh, that is out there today. Dr. Youngberg, I cannot thank you enough for that. That is phenomenal. You know, we we've kind of we kind of been a little bit sidetracked. We 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 ran with this one idea as though that's the only way out, but God's given us so many principles all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And of course, these principles don't just apply to COVID, as you yourself stated. You teach people how to prevent and treat um, neurodegenerative uh, situations such as Alzheimer's disease and different lifestyle disorders. So we will definitely have to have you come back, Dr. Youngberg, and share a lot more of these principles again. And for those of you who are watching, please go back and watch some of our previous shows as well, where we talk about the things that Dr. Youngberg is talking about and the importance, particularly of hydrothermal therapy. I myself had COVID and I can attest to what you're saying, Dr. Youngberg. It was the number one benefit to me. When I found my respiratory symptoms were increasing, it was truly that hydrothermal therapy. So again, thank you, Dr. Youngberg. Now, these principles of health, as Dr. Youngberg mentioned, he mentioned the 1918 Spanish flu, the pandemic at that time, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was utilizing these principles, then have continued to do so. In fact, it's a part of our belief system we again believe that God has given us these principles of health because he wants our bodies to be optimal. He wants us to be able to serve him to the best of our ability so that we can have happiness and health. Well, with that, Dr. Hassel, since the Seventh-day Adventist individual and member believes so strongly that our bodies are not just the temple of the Holy Spirit, but it's the place where God wants to make us happy. He wants to give us life and have it more abundantly. How does the COVID vaccine mandates, given this religious liberty issue, because we're talking about a, a religious conviction for Seventh-day Adventists that we believe that this health message, can you tell us, can you make sense of this? How does that kind of bring in the COVID vaccine situation? Well, I think, I think it is a religious liberty issue. Some people would doubt that. And, and we have in our document made it very clear that it is a religious liberty issue. And I would say it's a religious liberty issue for this reason. As long as the health message is the right arm of the gospel as Seventh-day Adventists have maintained throughout our long history, then it is part of our religious heritage, and it is part of our religious beliefs. If it is the right hand of the gospel, it must be a religious liberty issue for the 20 or so million Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters that we have around the world. You know, when, when members are coerced with the threat that their freedoms will be lost, when they're coerced with the loss of their livelihood, when they're coerced with the loss of 
uh, travel uh, freedom when they're coerced with the loss of education or having to take a vaccine in order to stay in school. Uh, when they are coerced with these kinds of things, it becomes a religious liberty issue because health and what we do with our bodies is tied into our, our religious faith and, and who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and it also becomes a religious liberty issue because we're seeing thousands of healthcare workers, thousands of government employees and airline employees and employees of other corporations now being forced to take a vaccine, in some cases against their conscience, and they are applying by the thousands for religious exemptions. And as long as they have that ability to apply for a religious exemption, then it is, in this country at least, considered a religious liberty issue. It must be if you can apply for a religious liber if you can apply for a religious exemption. But the fact is that some of those religious exemptions are actually being denied by employers. And some of them are being denied even in school situations, as we've been seeing in the news just in the last uh, week or two, which is quite, quite alarming to many people around the world. One person commented who signed our document that in her life as a Christian for 50 years, she has never felt her religious liberty challenged as it is right now today. And the church is called to defend this person, her, and defend others and their rights uh, to decide whether it is to take the vaccine or to not take the vaccine. It is the church's position to defend the rights of those individuals to, to practice their religious freedom in doing so. If they think the vaccine is going to be helpful to them and, and is going to be helpful in the long term, then they have the religious right to do so. If they think it is not going to be helpful and is going to be detrimental to their health, maybe they have certain comorbidities, maybe there are certain elements, um, immune deficiencies that they have that, that, that maybe the vaccine is not going to work, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, they have the right to decide that for themselves. And so that's where religious liberty comes in in this particular case. Thank you, Dr. Hassel. I really appreciate that. And I have a follow-up question for Dr. King along these same lines. You know, these principles that we've been talking about, these principles, these biblical principles of health that many espouse, particularly within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but there are other uh, individuals of, of our Christian brothers and sisters and other faiths that also espouse these same beliefs. For those who have this particular belief, and specifically since we're talking about the, doc the document entitled again to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, an appeal in defense of liberty of conscience. So we're specifically calling the Seventh-day Adventist Church at large Dr. King, because of the position that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has taken, particularly on health, do you believe that it even makes the issue of religious liberty in regard to vaccine to get or not to get an even stronger argument? Dr. King. seem to me, thank you for that question, Dr. Lewis. It seems to me that the Adventist church is in a particularly strong position in this regard because from very early in our history, we have held that there was an intimate connection between one's health practices and one's spiritual commitment. I like the Bible verse that Pastor Rafferty referred to earlier from 1 Corinthians 10 31, whether you eat or drink and that it is broadened to whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And because as Adventist Christians, we have held that biblical position, that there is this close connection between spiritual commitment and health, the Lord led us to develop a worldwide health care system. We have a number of medical schools in various places around the world, schools of nursing, schools of public health, that is one of the things that the Adventist church is known for. So I would say it should not be surprising at all that a number of Adventists take the decision about whether to get vaccinated or not as a very serious spiritual issue. 
sometimes the first presence of the Adventist church in any given country when evangelistic endeavors and mission activities were being organized would be to take care of the health of people, to send in individuals who were nurses or doctors to provide for the physical health of the people. So I just would say in conclusion of this answer that the practice of religion is clearly connected to health practices in the Adventist church. It's one of the ways that we live out our faith. And in this document, we've tried to indicate that we want to be very supportive of individuals who recognize the spiritual aspect of the decision, whether to vaccinate or not. And we are calling the church to be supportive of these individuals as well. Thank you so Thank much, you so Dr. Much, Dr. King. Appreciate, Appreciate that. I have a follow-up question for that with Mr. Zirkel. Mr. Zirkel, Section 6 addresses specifically the Seventh-day Adventist duty, the Seventh-day Adventist church's duty to protect religious and civil liberties. Can you describe to us how specifically in regard to the Seventh-day Adventist church's position on health and the religious liberty issue relate from a legal perspective? Mr. Zirkel. Yeah, so... <clears throat> It's really important that we engage in advocacy on this issue. You know, religious liberty is a principle. And if you, uh, it's like if, if, if no one, if just one person has it, then nobody has it. Basically, everybody has to have it or else nobody has it. And if you look at the history of the church, you know, you look back, the Protestants have really, the religious liberties are really the foundation of all of our modern freedoms. And uh, if you look at where they came from, they came from places like Magna Carta, which was based on a religious dispute is what that came out of. And then uh, more recently, and what most of us are more familiar with is Martin Luther, you know, and, and he had a bunch of early Protestant reformers with him. And then, you know, you move the story to, to, uh, to America and you end up with Roger Williams. And you can look at each one of these people. They were all advocating for religious freedoms for everybody. And out of all of this, we ended up with the principle of priesthood of all believers. And what that said is that everyone goes to the Lord on their own. And so that got translated into American jurisprudence is the idea that, that the only religious belief that you have to demonstrate for protection is a sincerely held personal religious belief. But, you know, right now, these ideas are really under attack and, um, it's sad. It's important for the Adventist church to show up to the fight, so to speak, because uh, right now, uh, one thing that's been particularly disturbing to me is something that's happened in the in Pennsylvania. There's a federal district court case, so this case doesn't have precedential value, but we can see where this court is thinking. We can It's applying the laws from the Third Circuit, and, and basically they were looking, actually it was a mask case, but they were looking at sincerely held religious beliefs. And this is what they said in their opinion. They said, moral concern for the body seems to be an isolated teaching rather than a belief system and corresponds to no formal and external signs. You know, what they're saying is, is because you don't come from a denomination that's willing to support you, that we're not going to listen to what you have to say. But if you listen to what's being said tonight, I mean, Adventists have had um, a religious view of the body our entire our entire time. But yet, we're being silent about this. And, and this is really bad. And I think that there's going to be bad law made if the churches won't step up to the plate and go to court and, and advocate for freedom of religion. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Zirkel. And you know, what we're finding, Mr. Zirkel is talking again, for those of you who just may have joined us, Mr. Zirkel, of course, is our attorney. He's a vice president for legal affairs for Liberty and Health Alliance. And what he's talking about is here in the United States of America, issues that we are particularly dealing with. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as this document is written specifically as an appeal to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of course, including... Uh, and not at the exclusion in any way, shape, or form of our Christian brothers and sisters of other faiths. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a global church. We have members all over the world. And of course, this is a global crisis, this pandemic. And so members throughout the world are, even in some cases, actually experiencing more difficulty in other countries than maybe even here in the United States. We are seeing members and individuals who have these religious convictions 
who have chosen for one reason or another not to get the vaccine, being unable to speak, receive an education, work, travel, and even the ability to buy and sell is being limited if one chooses to not accept the COVID vaccine. This is a problem, and we want to talk to some of our international guests as well. But I am very, very excited to introduce something, someone that many of you know who has just come into our stage, Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Carson, what a pleasure to have you with us here today. Uh, for my entire life, I have been in awe of you. As a, a prominent neurosurgeon, I remember as a little girl reading the book, Gifted Hands. In fact, you were one of the ones that inspired me to go into medicine. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist, but Amen. you inspired Amen. me. I remember many, many years ago, you spoke at a camp meeting I was at. Of course, you've had much, much uh, greater accomplishments than, than even that. And we're so happy and privileged that you joined us this evening. Dr. Carson, uh, we had a question for you. In light of the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and particularly as populations now who have chosen for one reason or another um, are experiencing mandates, mandates that are limiting their ability to make an income, to get educated, and just general well being. What is your perspective on these mandates, sir? Well, that's a very good question because a lot of people think. It's about vaccines and vaccinations. Uh, it's a much bigger issue than that. Uh, remember that uh, many people came to this country early on to try to escape from governments and monarchs who were always mandating things, telling them what they could do and what they couldn't do, what they could say, what they couldn't say. And we are in the process of opening the door for that to occur in this country. And once you open that door, it's very, very difficult to close that door back again. Uh, having said that, we also must look at this from a, a scientific point of view. Uh, we can't let politics and ideology invade the laboratory. And that's what we've done because we take people who have natural immunity, who've already had COVID, who have antibodies, and we say, that's not good enough. You still have to have the vaccination. Even though we know that if you've had COVID already, it tends to affect more components of your immune system in a positive way, uh, both IgG and IgA. Uh, so you get much more coverage, including mucous membranes, nasal cavities, and things like that, making it much less likely for you to spread the disease. So it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever uh, to say that people with natural immunity uh, still have to uh, undergo vaccination if they don't want to. Now, this is not to say that vaccinations aren't good, you know, particularly for elderly people uh, and for people with comorbidities, but everything is done on the basis of benefits and risk. And uh, of course, if elderly with comorbid uh, you have much higher risk from the disease than someone who, say, is a child uh, who has very little risk. Uh, and we don't really know what the long-term impacts are of the vaccinations. Why would you subject them to that kind of risk? So, you know, if we went back to using the standard types of benefit risk analysis that we do in medicine in general, we wouldn't be even having this problem. The reason we're having the problem is because we're so inconsistent. And that's what happens when you mix politics with medicine. And let me just go back and reiterate, you know, as far as mandates are concerned, uh, they have no place in a country that is supposed to be the land of the free where people are able to make choices. And if you give people the real information and stop trying to coerce people uh, or manipulate people, uh, I have no doubt that they will make very good decisions. Thank you, Dr. Carson. And again, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to join us. 
and we have the highest regard and respect for you. Again, thank you for defending liberty of conscience for all. And with thank that, you. thank you. And with that, I want to bring up another point. Dr. Carson talked about the United States of America and liberty of conscience that our country was based on with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, but not just our country. I believe these principles were given to us, and I believe we could support them from the Bible given to all mankind, made in the image of God, to be able to choose for oneself one's own input. With that, I'm excited to welcome Pastor David Stochich. Pastor Stochich is joining us from Newcastle, Australia. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Stochich. What time is it there, sir? Oh, it's um, good Good evening to you and uh, good afternoon to people who are watching in our time zone. It's uh, nearly one o'clock, 10 minutes to, nine, uh, to one o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us again. For those of you who missed the initial part of the presentation, Pastor Stochich is a pastor. He's the senior pastor in Newcastle, Australia. He's formerly been the president of and vice and vice president of conference there. Pastor Stochich, we have a question. We, we've seen many pictures, many images coming out from various parts of the world and, and the vaccine mandates that are taking place globally. Because again, it's not just something that's happening here in the United States. We've seen pictures of riots and different things coming out of Australia. Tell us a little bit about what it's like there and what's your perspective specifically on the vaccine mandates, sir? Well, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, to speak about that. Before that, I would like to say that um, I, like probably many people, have come into Adventist Church when I was about 20 years of age, quite a few years ago. And one thing that really attracted me to Adventist Church is that it, in the very DNA of Adventist Church, there is this holistic approach to life, uh, physical, social, mental, spiritual. Uh, so I really cannot separate any of these. I cannot divide, and, and may I say, I speak here for myself. I don't speak for anybody else. I don't speak for my employer. I speak as a Christian um, a person with a pastoral gift. So I cannot, I cannot separate medical from, uh, from, um, uh, from theological here at all. And uh, I agree with Dr. Hazel, Dr. King, and also uh, I'm really delighted that Dr. Carson spoke as well. And uh, yes, Dr. Carson came here to Newcastle a few years ago and we had a chat, it was, it was really good. But let me just uh, speak a little bit about what's happening here in Australia. Um, there is, um, we are known as the land down under, uh, the, the land of uh, one and free as our national anthem says. And um, uh, so um, we, at the moment, I believe a lot of people are not feeling very free and not very united either on, on, this, on this issue in the society and also in, um, I, I would say probably in the church as well. Uh, so these health mandates have caused a lot of angst. Uh, first, it started with the people who work in medical field and then uh, construction workers and then the latest information that I just got um, just very recently, two, three days ago, is that um, in the state of Victoria here in Australia, uh, there, is, there was this uh, health mandate where authorized workers uh, are now mandated to be vaccinated. And within those authorized workers are ministers and pastors. So our ministers also are facing that choice now. Uh, also our teachers uh, and our workers in, in the health sector as well. Uh, so what's my view on, on this? Um, as I've said, I look at life holistically. I believe we cannot separate um, the, the physical from uh, mental, from spiritual, emotional. I believe that whatever happens to one affects the other. Um, I believe that the document that, that the um, Liberty and uh, Health Alliance came up uh, with that appeal. It's a very balanced document uh, that uh, appeals to our members and our leaders to, uh, to um, uh, basically view 
uh, our our life, our body as as um, as, as a unit uh, that uh, we respect the conscience of uh, of other people who think differently. I just would like to point out that uh, we as Adventist people, Adventist Christian people, not just Adventists, the other Christian people who who quote this quote. Uh, some years ago, Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther stood before a council, state council, and he made a statement for uh, that that to, to go against one's conscience is neither right nor safe. Uh, so, as a Christian, my conscience is informed by my worldview, by my religious beliefs, and so I find it very difficult to separate to separate my conscience from my religious beliefs. I believe they significantly overlap. Uh, as a pastor, as a person, I believe that this, this, at this time, we have to appeal for unity. We need to uh, uh, ask people to recognize and see the greatest, greatest spiritual reality, instead of labeling and accusing people that they are, that they are uh, theologically ignorant or selfish because they put their wants before other people's uh, needs and that they are irresponsible citizens because uh, they are, if they get sick, somebody else will be paying their medical bill. I think we have to put that aside and see much greater spiritual reality here, the conscience for which uh, some people in the past, maybe even at present time, were prepared to sacrifice everything, their material possession, even their own life. So I think probably that's enough for me there. Thank you so much, Pastor David. We appreciate you joining us again from Australia and reminding us that we are a global body of believers and that when one part is suffering, we are all, all suffering. So again, when one part celebrates, we all celebrate together as well. Thank you again, Pastor David, for joining us from Australia. I'm excited to also welcome Mr. Jay Cameron. Mr. Cameron, we already introduced at the beginning, is a constitutional attorney in Canada. He's litigated at multiple different levels, in fact, all levels of the Canadian government, including the Canadian Supreme Court. And Mr. Cameron, we have some questions for you as far as Canada is concerned. We've, we've seen, again, images and pictures of how things are taking place in Canada. In addition to hearing what is going on as far as religious liberty for Canadians, particularly for Seventh-day Adventist Canadians, we also want to ask you a follow-up question to that, and that is specifically, how do we relate when we trust, do we trust our leadership, whether that be sometimes governmental or even sometimes even within a more local closed knit area? Is that, how do we do that? How do we justify that if it contradicts our own convictions? Mr. Cameron. Dr. Lewis, thanks first for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think that one of the important things that people need to realize is that the world has changed in Canada specifically. It's not the way it used to be. Things have become very dark. And that's unsurprising because the ax is being laid to the root of the principles that built the Western world. So there's a few very significant concerns. First of all, uh, uh, you, you have a lack of democratic accountability with the way that government is operating currently. You have the delegation of authority and you have a lack of democracy and democratic uh, accountability. So you have elected officials who have transferred their power to ministers of health and doctors. And then those people are making rules and laws for millions of people. And so um, those people have little uh, accountability to the electorate. And they don't know anything about economics or trade or agriculture or tourism or religion or the constitution. And, and so in Canada, universal health care has been the means of overthrowing civil liberties. And these people have created new laws unilaterally. They don't believe in inalienable rights. They believe that rights come from the state and that they can be removed from the state. And so they are. And so they have, they have, uh, they have attacked um, uh, churches, they've closed churches, prevented Bible studies, closed businesses. People have lost their li livelihoods by in the tens of thousands. There's prohibitions on peaceful protests. So if you, if you protest the draconian action, you get a $1,200 ticket for your trouble. And so, uh, you know, and, and there is an increasing tendency to take this further. And so a, a poll was actually sent out by the Ontario government 
asking the citizens whether or not they support the suspension of civil liberties entirely, whether or not they support taking people out of their homes who are unvaccinated and putting them into camps uh, somewhere safe. And so when this type of rhetoric is thrown around, you know that you've reached a very dangerous place. We also have the, uh, you know, the, the mass uh, censorship of, of the Internet. That's on the docket for the federal uh, government right now They're with their proposed laws. Um, and, uh, and the censorship and punishment of doctors and members of the public who voice concerns about the new COVID shots. Uh, there's a lot of doctors who have said, you know, we have concerns about these shots. We're observing neurological symptoms and heart symptoms, and and uh, and they've been vilified in the media. They've been punished by their professional bodies. They've been fired from their institutions and their hospitals, and so life has become very difficult. And and that is the establishment, Dr. Lewis, of a new orthodoxy, where you are not allowed to speak against what the prevailing narrative is. And if you do, you're punished. And um, particularly for those who have said that they're going to take a wait and see approach with the shots, the, the new COVID shots, uh, they've lost civil liberties uh, dramatically. You can't go to church. You can't have a Bible study. You can't go out to eat. You can't have family over um, who is unvaccinated. There are uh, severe limits with respect to and uh, other aspects of life. And there's a proposal to prevent uh, uh, all travel in the country domestically and internationally that was announced today by the federal government and so you see the window narrowing uh the noose uh closing and um and it's and it's all based on uh one particular argument and ignoring other aspects of scientific uh, evidence like natural immunity and the fact that there's serious questions about the efficacy and safety of of these new shots uh, Dr. Lewis, you have another question for me. You want me to just... That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just a little um, taken aback by what you said, Mr. Cameron. It, we want you to know, first of all, that um, our prayers are with you. And I think that, again, this document is entitled... Again, I, I want, for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to read the document, we ask you to go to Liberty and Health. Dot org liberty and a n d health dot org read the document and if you find in the document the beliefs that are so stated please sign the document again the title is to the seventh day adventist church an appeal in defense of liberty of conscience liberty of conscience for all and mr cameron what you just described um, truly is a liberty of conscience crisis and I, I again, I'm, I'm, my prayers are with, with all of you. As a follow up to, to your information, as far as the Canadian situation is concerned, I do have a question. What do you do as far as trusting leadership? I know that that's come up a number of times in varied discussions. How do you deal with that? How do you deal? What if the leadership um, disagrees with your particular religious convictions, Mr. Cameron? So one of the other presenters had talked about how we are to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. You don't render to Caesar what is God's. There's a separation there. And so, um, you know, there's there's no doubt that, that the mantle of leadership is a heavy one. There's a huge responsibility. And uh, only those who have led know how heavy it is. But that said, there is a line that is inappropriate for a leader to cross. And Jesus himself set that line. He said... Um, you know that, and you have heard that the Gentiles exercise authority over those who are under their control, but it shall not be so among you. And so he talks about servant leadership. And, and so the, the forcing of the conscience, the violation of the individual will, especially with respect to personal bodily autonomy, is antithetical to Christianity. And so I, I'm deeply troubled by the arguments that some leaders are making, including leadership in churches, uh, including our church. Where they are, are, where they are saying that, um, you know, I, this is an authority over here. Uh, you need to listen to what he says because he's smarter than you, and uh, you just need to do what you're told. And uh, and some of our medical professionals are making those arguments as well. And their argument, basically, when you synopsize it, you boil it right down. It, it sounds like this: Do you know who I am? Do you know what school I went to? Do you know how many things I have done? Do you know the studies that I have done? I say that these are safe. I've taken them myself. 
speaking of the COVID shots, you just need to do what I what I tell you. And and I'm I'm an authority here. And that appeal to authority, Dr. Lewis, is a fallacy. It's it's a logical fallacy where uh, people use uh, authority to attempt to win arguments. Just because somebody has studied a lot, just because they are advanced in scientific knowledge, uh, does not mean that they are correct. And when it comes to the rights of conscience, that argument is a very dangerous one. And it's been used uh, in times immemorial. In fact, you go all the way back to the garden and you see that the serpent in the tree is using the sim similar types of arguments. He's saying to Eve, I'm in the tree. I'm eating the fruit. Have you ever seen a talking snake before? What God said is not correct. What you think is not correct. You think you have dominion over yourself and with respect to the decisions that you're going to make, you don't. In fact, I'm telling you what's right. And you need to listen to me because I'm the one in authority here. I'm the one who's tasted this fruit. I'm the one who's touched this tree. So you just need to do what you're told. And so I, I'm very concerned by that argument. Fundamentally speaking, in Christianity, we know that Jesus says, come, let us reason together. And every person makes a decision for or against. And, um, and so it's, it's deeply troubling when somebody attempts to override the conscience of another. Thank you so much, Mr. Cameron. Thank you for joining us. We want to go to Dr. Hossel. Dr. Hossel, following up with Mr. Cameron, what he just described to us, are there any biblical justifications or biblical situations where opposition to mandates, even religious institution mandates, might actually be biblically appropriate? Well, we think automatically, and several have been mentioned already, but we think automatically with the three worthies on the plain of Dura, where they were faced with an alternative, either bow down to this image that Nebuchadnezzar had erected, made completely of gold, or suffer in the fiery furnace. And uh, of course, they were not the only ones that were there that day. There were leaders from all over the vast realm of the Babylonian Empire, and they were all there to be, give homage to the king and to his hope, which was in complete contradistinction to the vision that he had had some time earlier, where he only was the head of gold, and now he had a statue completely of gold, which meant that his kingdom would last forever. And these three Hebrew worthies who had been educated in the University of Babylon, who had been educated to serve the king, and who uh, had distinguished themselves, as we saw in Daniel 2, with Daniel by not defiling themselves with the king's meat and with the king's wine, uh, now we're faced with another decision. And they decided to stand. They decided to stand in that huge, huge crowd, in that huge arena, they decided to stand. And they decided to stand because they were true to what they believed was right and true to what they believed and knew to be revealed by the word of God who interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream originally. And I would say that today we need to be true to the word of God. We need to be true to our consciences and what our conscience is telling us is truth. And uh, we need to do that prayerfully. We need to do that spirit-filled in a spirit-filled way. We need to do that without reviling one another or, or casting blame on one another. But we have been called as a people to do that. You know, I think about my grandmother as I was listening to Mr. Cameron a few moments ago relating to what is happening in Canada right now. It kind of sent chills up and down my, my back because my family lived in a totalitarian government in Germany during the Second World War during the Nazi era. And my grandparents were constantly faced with these kinds of decisions. Uh, my grandfather, when he was drafted into the German army, was, um, was, was faced with, with uh, what to do as a uh, Seventh-day Adventist minister in that particular setting. And he decided to carry a wooden pistol instead of a real gun so that he would not be taking anyone's life. He decided that he would keep uh, the Levitical laws and not eat pork in the army for six years. And God placed in his unit a cook that happened to be a vegetarian and kept him uh, with him throughout that entire time of those six years so that my grandfather could be faithful to his health principled convictions. I remember my grandmother sharing with me how she refused on the streets of Frankfurt, Germany to give the Nazi salute which right now, by the way, is illegal to do anywhere in the world. 
but at that time was expected for every German citizen to show patriotism to the government and to the government regime at the time. And she decided instead of saying Heil Hitler as she passed people on the street. That took courage. That took a great deal of fortitude. But my grandparents were men and women of conviction, and God honored them for their convictions. And we need to also stand on our convictions today so that we can be a witness to those around us of what Christians will do when we are true to what God has revealed to us through his word in the times in which we live. And I want to thank Mr. Cameron and others for, for doing that in, in countries that have already maybe gone a lot further than the United States has. Uh, and and uh, our pastor from Australia, where, where things are not going well, we need to take note of these things. And as a church, rise up and say, we're going to support one another during this time. We're not going to go along with, with things that are against our conscience. We are, have to be true to a greater kingdom, and that is the kingdom of God. And that's ultimately who we uh, put our trust in. Dr. Hassel, I personally Dr. Hassel, I have read the book, A Thousand Shall Fall, multiple, multiple times to my children. For those of you who have not read that book, that is the story of Dr. Hassel's grandparents, and it is phenomenal. And yes, God is calling us to stand, I believe, to stand in defense of the stories that we're hearing coming out of. These are just two countries we've heard, Australia and Canada. We need to stand. We must stand. And along those lines, I want to invite Mr. Zirkel. Mr. Zirkel, we have a question for you. In Section 9, the document states that opposing government mandates is something that is the right of the Seventh-day Adventist Church if it's not following our religious convictions. Can you please tell us a little bit more about that, particularly in light of the three stories we just heard? Well, if you look at Section 9 of the document, what we're doing is we're citing to existing church policy, and we're just asking the church to abide by that policy. But those policies go way back in Adventist tradition. Uh, I think especially of uh, A.T. Jones in 1888, um, he was advocating in front of Congress uh, regarding the Sabbath. But the real principle that's, that's at stake here is one that Protestants have been doing forever. Um, I, as Pastor uh, Stojic said, um, quoting Luther, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. And if you look inside of our church policies about advocating for religious liberty, we have a religious liberty department, and, and they are called to advocate in favor of freedom of conscience. Um, we also, in that same policy, we talk about the dangers of uh, the union of church and state, which is exactly what A.T. Jones was talking about in 1888. Um, it's sad because what we are seem to be experiencing today is I feel like the church has become somewhat of a partner with the state um, in two ways. First of all, the church has decided to remain silent on religious liberty and matters of conscience, which is a very, very uh, detrimental thing. And the other thing that we see is in many places, the church is just advocating and and basically parroting a uh, government position on the vaccines, which isn't right. The church needs to have its own opinions. And, you know, it's, it's okay to stay out of politics, but where you have uh, religious conscious concerns, uh, the church really needs to be engaged. Thank you so much, Mr. Zirkel. With that, Mr. Pastor Rafferty, do the current mandate support a concern that's held by Seventh-day Adventists, a concern that's held by Seventh-day Adventists that potential future mandates may involve the issue of worship. Very good question, uh, Dr. Lewis. You know, we do not believe that taking this vaccine is the mark of the beast. I think that really needs to be clarified. Uh, we know, though, that that is a future issue, and that issue is going to come with economic sa sanctions, with loss of job, with loss of education, with loss of free movement, with not being able to buy or sell. So we're seeing 
some similarities here, at least in relationship to the mandates. But one thing we do know in Bible prophecy is in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel was tested in the area of health before he was tested in the area of worship. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about a test that's going to come to us before the abomination of desolation and the final mark of the beast crisis. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, in the King James Version, in the New King James Version, there is a word that Jesus used that is pestilence, which means an infectious and contagious disease. And he says that pestilences, along with earthquakes and famines and wars and rumors of wars, will lead all nations to hate a certain people group who believe in freedom, that is, who have God's name. God's name is synonymous with love, and love is synonymous with freedom. And it says that they will be afflicted, and that word afflicted means pressured. I believe we're seeing that happen right now. No, we're not in Revelation 13 yet, but we are in Matthew 24, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. We're moving in the direction of the abomination of desolation. We're moving in the direction of the fulfillment of Revelation 13. We need to be awake, we need to be aware, and we need to prepare. Thank you so much, Pastor Rafferty. That is very helpful. Pastor Kelly. Pastor Kelly, we want to come back to you because we want to follow up with Pastor Rafferty just said opposition to these mandates. There's been some discussion that if the church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, because of course that's what this doc document is talking to, correct? This is Seventh-day Adventist church. If we oppose these vaccination mandates for religious convictions, future mandates, as Pastor Rafferty just discussed, as far as issues of worship, et cetera, as related in Revelation 14, may become more difficult for us. Do you believe that to be the case, Pastor Kelly? Uh, not at all. And I think going to uh, the book of Daniel, we have that explained very clearly. Now, I think there's an assumption in the church that we're gonna have our discussions like the rest of the world has their discussions, uh, that we use kind of political modalities, that we don't have the respect and dignity that we're supposed to have. Uh, when we look at the story of Daniel, we find that there's this initial test in chapter one. And the question we need to ask ourselves, does that wound the credibility of Daniel in chapter two? And I would go so far as to say is that the test of chapter one was the definition of person where he could show respect and personal strength through the presence of the living God to properly define who has what authority over him. And the king figured this out real quick. And I would suggest that the reason, the only reason Daniel is in the lion's den in chapter six is that a new organization comes on the scene that doesn't understand the nobility and strength of person that Daniel has. And Daniel's demeanor, the Bible describes as one possessing an, an extraordinary spirit. So I think the problem inside the church right now is that they're failing to recognize that this is our opportunity to model what a mature and dignified discussion looks like. The Bible says that the wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. It also says that iron sharpens iron. So I would go so far to say is that the proper processing of dialogue and even disagreement here with our government, if done in the spirit of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were never tested again in the scriptures, that initial standing up to a test actually provides room and respect for the greatest exercise of freedom to proclaim the three angels. And so a proper processing of an initial test actually creates the most room for fulfilling the Great Commission. I love it, Pastor Kelly. Thank you so much. That's encouragement. That's encouragement, not discouragement. Thank you again, Pastor Kelly. With that, Mr. Knott, given the fact that we've heard all of the information thus far, what should the church do at this point? The document points out a course for its organizations and institutions. Can you disclose that to us, please, sir? Well, there are several action items uh, in the document. I'm going to refer to just point number 11, which calls for eliminating policies and actions that discriminate among employees regarding vaccination status. And um, of course, uh, at the same time, by extension, that could also apply to what happens in our schools, what happens in education. So I won't take time to read the actual detail of the statement. And if you're watching this program, it could be that that's because you may have already read the document itself. Now we all could come up with uh, our own 
real life practical illustrations of uh, this particular issue, that is potential discrimination among employees or against students based on their position on that. And I'm going to mention just one, and it does relate to what happens in our classrooms. A teacher in one of our classrooms has for years regularly taken his students on a series of intense, high quality field trips. Now, these aren't just pleasant, optional excursions. These are field-based experiences that are integral to a solid education in his discipline. Now, this particular teacher has chosen himself to be vaccinated, but he fully respects the decisions of his students who have chosen not to be vaccinated. So he's presented with a problem. Because of his institution's policies, some of the students can't go on those important trips. And so he understandably worries that in uh, whatever way that he can adjust for those students, uh, will he be providing a lower standard of education for those who can't go on those trips than he is for those who can? And so when he asks that question, uh, the argument comes back that in making such a separation among students, it shouldn't be viewed as a lower standard, but merely a different standard. Well, when you think about it a little bit and not to put too fine a point on it, those familiar with America's long and painful march towards civil rights, which is a related issue, will recall that long ago, we did away with the concept in education of separate but equal. Well, then the argument might come back, well, race is not a matter of choice, but vaccination is. Well, so is the Sabbath and our faith community throughout our history has always vigorously been defending our members' choice to keep the Sabbath and protect them from discrimination in employment. So on the matter of this increasingly controversial uh, vaccination, it seems to me that we need to do away with any kind of policy now that does discriminate among employees in our institutions and organizations, that discriminates among our students and um, treat everyone fairly. Thank you so much, Mr. Knott. Yes, we definitely need to treat all fairly and equally. And again, in light of liberty of conscience and choice for all. Well, we've heard from lots of individuals this evening. I want to turn back to Dr. King. Dr. King, liberty of conscience, the document calls the church to act by instructing pastors and church leaders to write and facilitate religious exemption letters, particularly for those who oppose the COVID vaccine so that they can continue to either be remaining employed or continue their education, etc. Can you please summarize the appeal and provide your thoughts on how you think that this might be accomplished in light of the information that we've been discussing and in particularly the written positions previously noted of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for the opportunity to answer that question. I think it was some disappointment and frustration in this area that helped to prompt the document. Some time ago, I recognized that something was amiss when communications went out discouraging pastors, those who were spiritual leaders, from assisting people in living out their sincere convictions in regard to vaccinations. And surprisingly enough, some of these missives went out from people who were supposed to be helping people and to help promote and protect religious liberty. I wonder if maybe we've forgotten sometimes, and I appreciated the quote that both Pastor Kelly and Pastor Stoykich referred to earlier, Martin Luther stating, to go against one's conscience is neither right nor safe. I believe some of these communications Dr. Lewis, were based on a misunderstanding of what it means to write a pastoral support letter. I certainly could not say that my denomination has decided, has taken a position against the COVID vaccinations. But I could certainly say I was just contacted by a work colleague in the last few days and her husband may be facing some challenges in connection with his work. I could certainly say that I know this individual to be a sincere Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I know him to be a person of integrity, and I would urge his employer to find a way 
to accommodate his sincere convictions. So my feeling is those of us who are spiritual leaders should certainly not turn away people who are trying to live out their sincere convictions, but would try to help them honor their convictions and be able to maintain their employment in the workplace. And that's what we are calling on spiritual leaders in the Adventist church and religious liberty, religious liberty leaders to be involved in, again, protecting and promoting religious liberty. Thank you so Thank you much, so much Dr. Dr. King. Mr. Zirkel, we have a follow-up question for you for that. Specifically, should we or how should we approach the government and even the secular media as we continue to support religious liberty, both for members within the Seventh-day Adventist community and those without? Well, I think we really need to be shouting religious liberty from the mountaintop right now. You know, there's a narrative that's going on in the media that basically says no denomination has an objection to the vaccine. And, and sadly, that seems to be uh, somewhat true, which is the whole reason why we're having this, this document. But we as a church need to be shouting from the top of our lungs that, that there are people with legitimate uh, issues with uh, their conscience on this matter. And, you know, here's the thing. Inside of our church, we have religious liberty departments. They're all across the nation. We have a small army of people that are ready to go. They've been trained in this. We have attorneys. And, you know, with attorneys, we're trained to zealously represent our clients. And we need to be zealously going after this. We need to be making press releases. We need to be filing amicus briefs with the courts. We need to think about filing strategic lawsuits. Um, we need to represent individuals. There's so much work that needs to be done right now. So many people are approaching me with really good lawsuits, whether it be at schools, whether it be against businesses. And one of the other things that's really bothering me is how many times I'm getting letters from schools and from, from employers that have no clues to what the law is. They are so out to lunch. They, they, they really don't have any idea what religious liberty is. And when we stay silent, what we should be doing is educating them. We need to educate them what the Protestant principles are that makes everyone free, not just Protestants, but everybody. And we have a team that can do this. And, and right now we're not. It's, it, it's a shame. Thank you, Mr. Zirkel. Well, again, this is a document calling for courage for all of us to stand for religious liberty. And we can all do that in our own spheres of influence. Some of us in the sphere like Mr. Zirkel is talking about in the religious liberty department, others in the medical community, others in the streets and on our homes. Again, this is a call for all of us to stand for liberty of conscience for all. Dr. Youngberg, we have a follow-up question for you. Does the position of the church previous, around 2016, I believe, took a statement as far as vaccinations, does that position, and the document, of course, addresses this, dictate the current position of the church on the COVID vaccine mandates? Dr. Youngberg. Dr. Youngberg, you're muted. Thank you. Um, it, it does not. The guidance pub, uh, that was originally published a few years ago by the Seventh-day Adventist Church promoting this judicious participation in past vaccines uh, came way before, years before we had any mRNA vaccine available to the public. And so, therefore, it should in no way be used to justify mandating this injection technology that has not been studied carefully for long-term health risk. In fact, the original developer of the mRNA vaccine, Dr. Robert Malone, is strongly against uh, mandating this. Moreover, I don't personally de deny that there may be some benefit of taking the mRNA vaccine for some individuals. But for many others, especially those under the age 30, and particularly for those under the age of 18, the current data shows that the risk actually outweighs the benefit. So in my opinion, there's, there's really no overall scientific uh, public health basis for mandating this mRNA vaccine, especially since all the studies and the data to this point show that it doesn't actually prevent uh, COVID infections, okay? It might, 
a decrease in intensity of, of mild to moderate symptoms in some, but as we now know, it does not prevent transmission of the virus, even for those who are fully vaccinated. So, so uh, uh, promoting a mandate of a vaccine of this type, of this technology, ha has no basis in good science and public health uh, policy. Thank you so much, Dr. Youngberg. We appreciate that. Uh, do, uh, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Greg Nelson, I believe we had a little bit of computer technology issues early on. We had a question for you. You had a wonderful quote for us on liberty of conscience. Can you please share that with us, sir? Yes, I just want to say that we, you know, as Christians need to stand up and we need to make sure that, you know, our example is Christ in every interaction that we have and that we follow his example in discussions that we we love first uh, people we're discussing this with and that you know we stand up for our liberties because we need our leaders to stand up right now because it's very very important i mean this is the most important time when there's all this crisis and people are losing their jobs that we as christians need to follow Christ's example in interactions and everything and i did want to read a quote from great controversy um, it says the framers of the Constitution recognize the eternal principles that man's relationship to God is above human legislation and his rights of conscience are inalienable. Re reason was not necessary just to establish this truth. We are conscious of it in our own bosoms. It is this consciousness which, in defiance of human laws, has sustained so many martyrs in tortures and flames. They felt that their duty to God was superior to human enactments, and that man should exercise no authority, no authority over conscience. It is an inborn principle that nothing can eradicate. And I just think that, you know, as Christians, you know, we need to stand for each other. One of the principles that Christ led is it's not just, we're not just involved in this. Our brothers and sisters that were heroes six months ago are now pariahs in society because you know, of a government edict. And, you know, as Christians, we need to support each other and our leaders really need at this point in time to stand up. They really need to stand up and we need to pray for them. We need to pray hard that they will have the Holy Spirit come in them and the Holy Spirit will channel what they should do and, and tell them, you know, that, that they need to stand up because this is not only a religious liberty issue, this is an issue between us and our God personally. Wow, Dr. P Mr. Nelson, that's that's very inspirational. I guess I have a follow-up question for you. How, in your opinion, do we stand defense of our relationship, as you put it, with God when we're the only ones? What what do you say to someone who might be the only one or might be about to lose their job if they stand up? What kind of encouragement would you provide to them, sir? Well, I mean, we have to look to the Bible. There's so many instances where people were, they had no hope, you know, the, they were faced the red, you know, standing against the Red Sea and God opened it. So we, we have to rely on God at this time. We have to pray more. We have to abide in him always. And that's the only way we're going to make it through here. We can do our little thing here as humans. God is the one that's going to happen to open the Red Sea for us on this issue and open the eyes of our leaders that this isn't an issue of, you know, going down the wide road. We need to go down the road that God wants us to do. And the wide road right now is all the governments, all the, you know, big businesses, all pharma, everybody has joined together to force um, this issue. And it, it's used coercion. The biggest thing they're using is fear. And fear is not a way. Um, Christ never use fear. He never used coercion. Uh, Satan did. And you got to look at those principles and see that we have to, as Christians, follow Christ's example always in every instance. And right now, we, we just have to pray for each other. And we, we have to do all of our conversations has to have to be Christ-like, because if they're not, and we can't end as loving brothers in the church, then we've lost the conversation. And that's got to be the number one principle in, in these discussions. And, and when we, because, because if we don't do this, then the, the, then the Satan wins. And we, you know, we don't want that. We want to keep abiding in Christ 
and doing this in a loving way, but also standing up. Thank you so much for that encouragement, Mr. Nelson. Pastor Ron Kelly, we're asking you to give us the closing words of how we move forward, specifically how we move forward with courage in defense of liberty of conscience. The document ends with a statement. Can you please encourage us, Pastor Kelly, encourage our leadership? Thank you so much. Well, I've been very blessed by this evening. I hope it blesses many others. I, I think the way we move forward is with much prayer and humility and honesty and respect. And I think the way to move forward is to go to where we started back in uh, December of 2020, when in our official paper, we wrote, uh, we reiterate that the decision to be immunized or not is the choice of each individual and should be taken in consultation with one's healthcare provider. Personal research on the subject is important. We ultimately rely on the following biblical health, following biblical health practices and the spirit of prophecy and following God's leading in our lives, which will bring us peace and assurance in our decision making. Now, with that kind of foundation underneath us, we have certainly enshrined uh, the power of the individual to pray their way into a knowledge of how they should relate to this. You add to that the science, which is an ongoing dialogue, at least it should be. And pretty soon you allow people to make prayerful, intelligent decisions. Uh, those decisions can be supported uh, by our church, including its religious liberty establishment. I think I'd go a lot farther to say this. We are in a very unique moment in history where because other churches did not progress on to a fuller embracing of truth, they were left out the holistic ministry of the gospel, which actually touches the physical person. Adventists were given this ministry. We have blue zones that include an Adventist community like Loma Linda University. We have people that live seven to 10 years longer. Why is that? That's because in our doctrine and in our belief system and in our life practice, we embraced the principles of the gospel of health for the organism of the human machinery that was created. So I think we're at a moment where the only church with real credibility that can stand up to these mandates is the Seventh-day Adventist Church because for the last 150 years, it has had a, a systematic and highly supported and embraced teaching by the larger part of its congregants that actually believes that health is central to spiritual well-being and to liberty and to a clear-eyed relationship with God. So, you know, the Bible tells us that he's shown us what's good, and that is to do justly, which requires honesty, respect, to love mercy, which means stick up for the undefended, the underdogs, those individuals that have been mentioned here tonight who were once heroes, and now those very same people, many of them who caught COVID taking care of people who had no real vaccine to run to for many, many months, those people in large proportions in our denomination now need the support of the official church of the family of God and to walk humbly with our God. You know, when you're in a dialogue and you have to resort to strong emotion and it can't remain a noble um, iron sharpening iron moment about truth, uh, you've got a weak argument. I think we need to be reminded of a quote that many of our young people were taught through the years, that the greatest want of the world is the want of men or people who can't be bought or sold, men who in their most souls are true and honest, men and women who do not fear to call sin by its right name. This coercion is sin. It is a societal sin. It is a sin against the person. And it's time for our church to recognize that they have the opportunity to be light in the midst of darkness. People whose conscience is as true to duty as a needle to a pole. People who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. And one more quote, uh, writing in Gospel Workers, uh, Ellen White says, some have no firmness of character. There are but little practical use in the world. There is in true Christian character an indomitableness that cannot be molded or subdued by adverse circumstances. We must have moral backbone and integrity that cannot be flattered, bribed, or terrified. You know, uh, I, I want the leadership of our church to know how loved and appreciated they are, that we are praying for them, but that what it takes in the pulpit and what it takes in the pastorate is what is still needed in the pastoral administration of this church. All we need is someone or maybe a few to begin to identify this is a moment for the Adventist church to stand apart. And yes, it will cost, it always has, 
But remember, when a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Respect, dignity. These things are what mark credibility. We should model it, we should live it, and we should show the world the truth that they've passed by. And we should provide for many other people who in innately know that this, this is an overreach of government and they do have agency over their body. There should be a church that stands up and says, you know, you didn't know this, but that's exactly what the Bible teaches. So our prayers are with those that are making decisions and our love and support. And by God's grace, we can go back to that place we were in December of 2020 when we ensconced and valued uh, people making personal decisions. That was very, very inspirational, Pastor Kelly. And I was moved in my heart. Can you have closing prayer for us too tonight, sure. please? Father, thank you for uh, so many loving and courageous people that have decided that they will stand apart. I'm praying, Lord, tonight that they would sense the full support of their church, which many of them had to lose family members and jobs to become a part of. And now, Lord, I'm praying that you'll bless everyone from the youngest to the oldest, from those that wield the most influence to those who wield the littlest, with the spirit of Christ, being willing to lay all on the altar. And if they sacrifice friends or positions or promotions or whatever it might be, or the favor of man or woman, that they would have that peace in their heart, that they have humbly done what's right. They've been honest in addressing their own fears and they have taken and let the Lord who walked alone all the way to Calvary walk with them by their side as they live out the calling of being God's remnant people, God's remnant leaders. Thank you for this time together. Bless this program. May it go wherever you wish it to go. And may there be a nobility and dignity about each of us that makes it hard not to listen. And may we do good listening. And may we show that Christians know how to solve problems the best way because they love each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Kelly. And I want to thank you to our viewers. Thank you so much for continuing to support Liberty and Health Alliance. Again, if you haven't yet had the opportunity to go to the website libertyandhealth.org, libertyandhealth.org, please click on the document, read it through. And if your heart burns within you, Put your signature on the line, a signature that stands for courage to defend whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. We support liberty of conscience, liberty to choose, religious liberty for all. We wish you God's blessing. We hope and pray for each and every one of you. Please send in your information. And again, until next time, God keep you well and happy in him. God bless.